How would you solve the issue between the SSPX and Rome? <laughs> and what is the it? Yeah. I wouldn't. No, uh, <laughs> I know I'm not going to, but... Uh, well, all right, the issue between the SSPX and Rome, of course, is that um, the SSPX was founded back in the uh, 70s, early 70s, by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre for the uh, express purpose of preserving the traditional Mass, which at that time uh, Pope Paul VI was on a, um, on a uh, hunt against. Now, there's something we've got to be very, very clear about here, okay? Okay. <clears throat> when Benedict XVI declared in the Ismodo Proprio Sumorum uh, Pontificium that the traditional missile, etc., had never been outlawed, he was right de jure, that is, by the law. Okay. However, de facto, that is to say, in the real world where people live, <laughs> In 1974, uh, the Congregation for Divine Worship issued a note forbidding the use of the old missile. Ah. Now, there, is a, there are two Latin words which you've heard me use before in this series, and I, I, again, they need to be known by every man, woman, and child, not just for religious matters, but also for political. Ultra vires beyond your strength. You can't do that, smart guy. Bad touch. Bad. <laughs> Ultra <laughs> Okay. All right, well, so I, 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 would, I would urge all of, all of my watchers and listeners and readers, all of you, memorize those two words, Ultra Vires. Now, when an individual does something that is beyond his capacity, beyond his competence, he violates the law. Okay. In spirit, if not in, uh, if not in uh, letter, and sometimes both. So, the reason why the, uh, the uh, Tridentine Mass and all that were never abrogated was because the bull that established them, quo primum, was never abrogated. Now, some people said the Pope couldn't abrogate it. I don't know if that's true. Whether or not he could or he couldn't, he didn't. And so because he didn't, that 1974 note was ultra vires. I see. Because a note from a congregation does not outrank a bull of the standing of Quo Primo. Yeah. It was ultra vires. But under that note, hundreds if not thousands of clerical careers around the world were destroyed. And in an era when we're used to popes apologizing, I think that probably would be a good place to start if we're really into, like, apologies and stuff. If not, it doesn't matter. But if you really want an apology that means something, that's a good place to start. So amongst these people that were damaged was Archbishop Lefebvre. He'd set up this, um, he'd set up this uh, fledgling organization. It had been given uh, Episcopal uh, approval in a diocese, which incidentally is how orders start out. You start out, you get, uh, you get um, uh, approval from a diocesan. You do your, your stuff. Eventually, if all goes well, you'll get papal approval, and you can expand into all kinds of other things. But that, that was what they were operating under. But once a bishop gives his approval, he can't just withdraw it. All right? There's a whole procedure under canon law, and it has to, the withdrawal of approval has to be approved by Rome. They don't have to approve the approval, but they do have to approve its withdrawal, if you, see the, if you see what I mean. Okay. Well, the reason for this is that if you didn't do that, then fledgling religious communities would be unable to have a period of stability to develop in. Everything would just be whatever popped into whatever bishop's mind. You know, and as we know, usually what pops into their minds is all of nothing but goodness and sweetness. But on very rare historic occasions, uh, there have even been anti-Semitic bishops. Wow. Yeah, I know, it's hard to believe. Um, of course, it was all long ago, back when people could have bad thoughts. Now they're all outlawed, so we don't have them. But in any case, uh, what should happen? But that the, uh, the the Roman authorities prevail upon the bishop, the succeeding bishop, to lift his approval, but the canonical forms aren't gone through. So what happens? 
he appeals uh, to uh, the Apostolic Signatura to hear his case, which is a lot more involved than that, but that's what it ended up with in 76. Archbishop Lefebvre appeals to the Signatura to hear his case. The Cardinal Secretary of State, Vio, forbade the Signatura to hear the case. That was ultra vires. The Secretary of State has no such authority and no such power. Okay. But, again, imagine that you were in Lefebvre's position. You have appealed to the highest court of the church, and that appeal is cut off not by the judicial authorities, but by an executive character. Yeah. What would you think? And again, remember that the new code of canon law takes in feelings into account very, very strongly. And it goes so far as to say that uh, no censures are valid if the uh, person who did them, who did whatever was being censured, uh, was motivated by, a, uh, by fear oh. or a desire for self-defense, even if, objectively speaking, those feelings are incorrect. It's all there in the new code of canon law, which, I, which ironically, the SSPX don't go by, but life is filled with these little paradoxes, isn't it? <laughs> At any rate, uh, so that from that point on, the drama developed as it, as it developed. Yeah. With that beginning in bad faith on the part of the Roman authorities, how would you get the SSPX to trust them? So then they come very close to a deal in 1988. And one of the things that Lefebvre was promised was that he would have, an Episcopal would be able to consecrate a successor. Because, of course, without bishops doing this stuff. Right. So he said, oh, yeah, sure, sure, you'll get one. He said, well, fine, when? We, we, you'll get one in the future. Oh, but yeah, but when? But we, soon, we, at some point. And the date when this thing was supposed to take effect came closer and closer and closer. Well, at the end of the day, the Archbishop's nerve failed him. The in my reading, what failed him? His nerve. Oh, his, okay. His or his trust in Rome's word failed him. Okay. Now, whether he was objectively correct, I can't tell you. I don't know. What I can tell you is that he certainly had an unpleasant body of experience behind him. Right. You know, if I keep smacking you around, and then I promise you I'm not going to on this occasion, I might not, then I might be completely sincere. <laughs> but your ability to judge that, presuming you're not Criswell or, or don't have, you know, mind-reading abilities, you might, at the end of the day, fall back into fear. And you can say, he should have been saintly, he should have been heroic, maybe indeed. But, you know, it's easy to urge others to be saintly and heroic. It's so much harder to be that way ourselves. So, that's the background. Yeah. And it created a huge amount of distrust of Rome in the society. So, so... He, so he consecrated the... The, the four bishops. The four bishops himself. Right. And then John and then with Paul the help of one excommunicated of the him. Well, not exactly. <clears throat> not exactly. He didn't do bell, book, and candle excommunication by name. Oh, okay. What happened was that it was declared that by doing an act... See, there's something called lata sententiae, which is by the, the act itself. In other words, for instance, if you um, perform an abortion, you don't have to be excommunicated by the pope or a bishop. Oh, I see. The action does it for you. Now, it can be announced that you've done this in a Vatican paper, but that just means that the Pope has acknowledged that you've excommunicated yourself. He did not excommunicate you. Now, that's kind of important. It's also important to bear in mind that none of their followers were excommunicated. Okay. Only the four bishops, and Lefebvre and the bishop who helped him, Castro Meyer, who's a Brazilian. So, anyway, there you had there it sat for quite a while. Now, bear in mind that all the while at this time we're making all sorts of nice noises, not just to the Orthodox, but to the Anglicans, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, etc. The heyday of the ecumenical movement. Now, as you as you know, having interviewed me before, I'm incapable of accusing anyone of hypocrisy. But for a lot of people, it looked that way. So, that brings us to the present. 
Benedict XVI attempted to reconcile the SSPX. Uh, he lifted the excommunication of the four bishops, which was the only canonical uh, punishment that had been levied against them. And again, given the muddied reasons for Lefebvre doing what he did, I think the case could probably be made, presuming that their case could be heard in a court not forbidden by a Secretary of State, um, that Lefebvre's action was out of fear, out of self-defense. Anyway, so where does that bring us? Uh, bear in mind also that all the while that the SSPX was developing and growing and doing its thing, things were happening in our church as well. And there was uh, the famous case of Professor John Senior in Kansas, the uh, uh, very famous man in Catholic letters. He started going to an SSPX chapel. And he was interviewed and said, well, why are you doing that? Don't you know they're excommunicated? And his response was, well, if, we're, if Weakland is in, who could possibly be out? <laughs> Referring to Archbishop Weakland. And again, you know, I, uh, there are many dioceses around the world who, if schism means anything, have been, and some even are, in a state of material schism from Rome. And yet somehow this is never addressed. All right. Uh, Benedict, as I say, went out of his way to try to patch things up with them. They were not interested at the end of the day because he insisted that they accept the changes in teaching made by Vatican II and they wouldn't do it. And the irony there, and there is an irony there, uh, is that as one Australian theologian put it, 85% of what's in Vatican II, the SSPX have no trouble accepting. 15% they do. The real question here is why is it so many bishops and seminary heads have no trouble with the 15% but balk at the 85%? And then again, if you're going to pretend you accept Vatican II, where's the Latin in your mass? Oh, I'm sorry, I read the documents. <laughs> I, we should be guided by the Spirit, I know. Anyway, I digress. So, what should happen, but that um, uh, Benedict got a storm of opprobrium for having done this, and uh, Bishop, um, uh, gosh, I know, I know his name as well as my own, it's just went right through my head, Bishop um, Williamson uh, had uh, questioned the numbers of the Holocaust, which blew up at about that time, and Pope Benedict was given all kinds of abuse, and he wrote a letter complaining about how he was abused which is worth reading, I have to say. And he made the point, you know, you can uh, make all sorts of openings to anyone you like, no matter how bizarre, and everyone will go along with it. But uh, do it this way, and you'll have your head handed to you. And that, believe me, is not that far off from what Pope Benedict wrote. So that brings us to the present. The problem, as I see it, is that there's a huge, to me, the epitome of the way things ought to be is the relationship with the late great Cardinal McIntyre and Dorothy Day, the founders of the Catholic Worker. You, go, you all can look that up if you like, and you'll see what I mean. But there are people who are so furious at the SSPX that the very idea of there being an accommodation with them cheapens the whole notion of the Church. There are people within the SSPX for whom any kind of connection with Rome is absolute apostasy. I was trying to get hypocrisy and apostasy together and they didn't come out at once. Uh, and everyone is so virtuous. Everyone is so wonderful. If, when you look at the SSPX and you look at the church of today, your first impulse is how wonderful I am that I'm not connected with those people. They're better than you are. I'll say that again. If you're not connected with the SSPX, and your immediate thought about them is, those schismatics, ah, you're all about you. You're so perfect and wonderful. If you're in the SSPX, and your first thought about anything to do with Rome is, oh, you heretics, or it's the same thing. There will be an end, really, to this problem between the SSPX and the rest of the church. 
probably when both sides are willing to accept the fact that they too can be wrong. As Pope Benedict pointed out for various other reasons, with every schism, either and most often both sides have brought it by being stupid and nasty. He didn't use those words, but it was clear, and I'll, I'll use it. So probably less stupidity and less nastiness would help on both sides. But we love our stupidity and our nastiness. We, we cradle ourselves with it. So we'll see. They've been offered a, uh, as, as of this going uh, outing, they've been offered a uh, personal prelature like Opus Dei has. What uh, exactly is, does that mean? Is that like an ordinary? No, because an ordinary includes <laughs> lay people. Uh, okay. A personal prelature is a purely clerical thing. And what it does is it removes the, uh, the clergy and the professed religious of, well, in this case, Opus Dei, which is the only, it was created for Opus Dei, and they're the only other one. Um, their, uh, their religious and their, uh, their clergy are completely outside the diocesan structure. Wow. Answerable only to their, first to their general, or whatever they call the head of the Opus Dei, and to the Pope, but not to any bishop. Wow. So, but that's the religious. The people depending upon the degree of attachment, of, of uh, institutional attachment to the order. Uh, the people are still nominally under their, under their bishops. But of course, you know, if, obviously if you're in a noble state parish, you're not really concerned about the bishop. Yeah. Um, but if, presumably this will be the case with the SSPX. Uh, I hope they'll accept it, but it will if they do, it will cause a lot of people to break away. I don't know how many. A lot of SSPXers. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, the irony here is that it was a little bit harder because Pope Benedict XVI not only had been a Paritas at Vatican II, but he was much more of an explicit theologian than this Pope. And he got his head handed to him for trying to do anything for the SSPX. And then, in turn, they didn't really reply well. But, contrary-wise, um, <laughs> contrary-wise, this Pope is uh, much less concerned about uh, theological niceties on the one hand, and on the other hand does have the clout with the media and so on to do it, which Bennett probably couldn't have done. Sort of like uh, Clinton being able to do welfare reform when no Republican could have done it and Nixon being able to open to China when no Democrat could have done it. 